Hello, happy Friday. Hey, yeah, Diana, I hadn't been, I wasn't saying anything yet, but thank you. Hello, happy Let me turn Friday. this, I got my phone right here. Sorry about that, let me turn this down. All righty, so I know this is, um, um, you guys are not used to me going uh, live on a Friday, first of all, and then um, during, a, during a time like this, but I had some time. I had a few people email me and ask me to do um, more C, another CMAA practice. Um, so I said, let me go ahead and do it while I got some time. Now, um, first of all, let me say hi before I get into this. Let me just say hey to everybody. Shakira. Hey, Shakira. Um, lovely Linus. Oh, she says, lovely Linus says, good luck, Stephanie. Let me see what Stephanie said above. I think I responded to her in the comments. Oh, Stephanie says her exam is coming up in a few days. Okay, Stephanie. We definitely wish you the best on that test. Hey, Veronica. She says, I hope your birthday was very special and enjoyable too. Yes, thank you. It really was, Veronica. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. Um, Cassandra says there's no sound. I'm not sure. Cassandra, can you hear me now? Um, it must be on your end. Um, Indigo says, hello. Hey, everybody. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, so I, like I said, I started this, um, I started this live today because a few people asked me to do um, more CCMAA. So I will tell you this, for those of you that that normally join me live, I'm doing it differently today. So if you notice in the title, it, I think it says open-ended questions. I, you're going to see I'm doing it completely different than how I normally do it. You guys know I normally do multiple choice, but I'm not doing it this time because one thing that I'm constantly telling people that reach out to me for exam advice, you want to be able to know this stuff without seeing it. If you can answer these questions without seeing a multiple choice, um, without seeing multiple choices to pick from, then you know you know the information. So going forward, I'm going to do more exam practice like this where it's just going to be open-ended questions, all right? Um, before I get started, let me look at a few more of these comments. Um Oh, Gemini Nail says this is her first live. Welcome, Gemini Nails, but she's been binge watching. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Um, Laura, Laura Costas, I'm sorry if I'm saying this wrong. She says, Hi, Miss K. So I start classes next week, but thinking of withdrawing. I have I'm having doubts about not being able to do injections and blood draws with advice. Okay, so good question. Um I understand because you're going to be going into a, a new field. This is something you've never done before. So I will tell you this on a clinical side, you do have to um, understand that you will be working on each other, you know. Um, and so I do want to just kind of put that out there, make sure you know that. But by the time you get to the hands on stuff, you will have learned about it and you will have, you know, made friends in the class, got more comfortable with your instructor and things like that. So by that time, you may be OK. You know, now, if you absolutely have a fear of needles and given because i had some students that that was in my class that wasn't even just afraid of getting needles they were afraid of giving them now if you have that fear then i would say maybe consider the administrative side but if it's just you're nervous you know i get it it's understandable but before you even get to that point where you're sticking you're going to have time you want to watch videos your instructor is going to demonstrate with you you guys are most likely probably going to start on a fake arm if they have one so, you know, um, I would say hang in there. If this is something you really want to do, hang in there. It's perfectly normal to be nervous. Um, okay, Cynthia, congr congratulations. Okay, Cassandra says she can hear me now. All right, Nikisha says she's watching from Florida. Hey, Nikisha, thanks for joining. All right, guys. So you guys that always join me, you know the drill. Um, shout out to everybody that passed. We got Jacqueline Lee. She passed. Um, Tashina passed. Congratulations. Myra, Pure Heart passed. We got Destiny here. Maria, Les Kier. I hope I'm saying that right. Alicia. Um, I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. I don't want to mess it up. Uh, Miss Third Event. Bethany, Red. Crystal, Desi, and Desi, she was on the exam practice just a few days before. That's why I remember her name. Congratulations, Desi. Um, Turbo Shot, Pass, Alexis, the Magic Cinnamon Roll, Shelly. Congratulations to everybody. So if you have passed 
I know you guys are writing it in the in the live chat. Make sure you also write it in the regular comments too, so that way I can see it. Like Shakira, congratulations, she passed. I remember she was on the video on the live with us. If you want me to shout you out, just make sure you guys, um, you know, put it in the regular comments so I can screenshot it like this, okay? Um, Carolyn, NP Creations, um, Manuela, Tyasia. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, congratulations to you all. I'm very proud of you for passing. And this is a few tips. You guys know the routine. This is what we do every 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 um, time. You guys can screenshot the tips. Um, but you guys, you know the routine. Veronica says, congratulations to all who passed their exams. So happy for each one of you. Thank you, Veronica. And hey, Andre, that's fine. You can go ahead and email me. Um, I think you were supposed to do that last time. But yeah, go ahead and email me. All right, guys, we're going to get started. Again, if you just joined, if this is your first time with me, welcome. I forgot who that was above that said this is her first time. So how I normally do it is normally multiple choice questions, and I go through each question and let you choose. But this time, there is no multiple choice. They are open-ended questions. So I'm going to ask the question, give you guys a few moments to answer, and then I'll reveal the correct answer. If you can answer the questions this way, then you know you know it. It's easy to be able to pick it from multiple choices. But when you can answer open-ended questions, then you know you are absolutely ready. All right. So what document identifies what procedures are allowed if a patient is no longer able to make medical decisions? So this is something that the patient signs, right? They sign this um, in advance, right? Just in case something happens, okay? And then, and they're no longer able to make medical decisions. What form is this called? Now, if the multiple choices were listed, you will be able to pick it out from, from the multiple choices, but I want you guys to think about it. It's the form that the patient signs, the document, legal document that the, that the patient signs. Okay, I see some answers popping up. DNR, power of attorney, DNR, living will. Power of attorney. I, I'm seeing some answers here. All right, I'll give it a couple more seconds, see if anybody else puts anything there. All right, so the answer is an advanced directive. So a DNR, power of attorney, and living will, those are all good answers. Why? Because in, in an advanced directive, those things are within an advanced directive, right? So a DNR, that's a do not, do not resuscitate order. So that could be within an advanced directive, a living will as well. And a power of attorney is also a sign. So it's the a form, keyword, the form that the patient signs. The power of attorney is a person that they, um, is the, the, the position, right? That's the position, not the form. Yes, Yannette, it's advanced directive. Exactly. Yep. All right. Falsifying notes in the medical record is an example of what? Falsifying notes in the medical record is an example of what? <clears throat> Falsifying notes in the medical record is an example of what? Okay, I'm seeing a fraud popping up. All right, let's see. That is correct, fraud. So that's good. Thank you. I'm glad you guys recognize that. So that way, when you go take the test, um, no matter how it's worded, you already know what fraud means. So it doesn't matter how the question is 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 um is is written right because of one of the biggest things that you all have been telling me is that these practice test questions are not on the test and that is correct the same questions you may see some like i always say but the same questions most likely won't be on it they're going to word it differently but as long as you know what fraud means it doesn't matter as long as you know what advanced directive is it doesn't matter how it's worded okay now, many people do live, li use living will and advanced directive interchangeably because the, 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 the definition is very similar. So I will tell you this. Don't worry. You won't see both of them listed as an option. So it won't be a situation where you will have to choose between an advanced directive and a living will. So don't worry. Don't 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 be too worried about that. All right. So this documentation is an explanation of benefits that goes to the provider 
to break down how payment was made is sent along with payment to the provider. So this is a document. It's, a, it's an explanation of benefits. So this goes to the provider's office and it breaks down how a payment was made. Like it lets them know if anything was denied, what was paid, you know, it breaks down exactly how um, the claim went. Details of the claim is sent along with the payment to the provider. Okay, I see some answers popping up here. <clears throat> I see remittance advice. I see admittance. Congratulations, Nat, for passing your test. I remember you were here. I think you, you had your test scheduled for the next day. Congratulations. Make sure if you want me to shout you out in the next video, make sure you comment that in the regular comments so I can take a screenshot of it. All right, let's see. Remittance advice. That's correct. You guys are making me proud right now. So remittance advice, that is an explanation of benefits that goes to the provider, right? So you guys know what EOB or expl exp I'm sorry, explanation of benefits, that's a form that goes to the patient that details the claim, right? Remittance advice goes to the provider, okay? So that, yes, you guys are on it. So what should you do if a patient comes to your desk while you're on the phone with the patient? with another patient. So you're on the phone with the patient and another patient comes to your desk. What should you do? What should you do? The patient walks up to your desk. The patient is trying to check in, but you're already on the phone with another patient. <clears throat> what do you do? <clears throat> I'll give you guys a moment to write that out. <clears throat> And if anybody is watching the replay, that, that's your few moments to um, think about it. I can tell some of y'all, 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 y'all memorizing this, that, that practice test. <laughs> Stephanie and Gemini, Shelly, Veronica, y'all, y'all can tell y'all have access to the study, to the practice test. <laughs> Cause that's, that is exactly right. You want to acknowledge the patient in front of you by nodding and continue assisting the patient on the phone so if you are on the phone with the patient right and another patient walks in you simply want to acknowledge that patient in front of you now mind you the question the answer may not be written like this so don't get caught up in these words for verbatim okay but simply make sure you know that you're supposed to acknowledge that patient in front of you right nod to them give them eye contact you know, just acknowledge them. That's the biggest thing that I want you to take away from that. You're going to acknowledge that patient in front of you, but you're going to continue with the with the patient on the phone. OK, the only time the patient in front of you comes first is if you're already working with that patient in front of you. Then if the phone rings, you'll put, you know, answer the phone and put that patient on hold and then finish with the patient in front of you. OK, but if you're already on the phone, um, if you're already on the phone, then, um, you know, continue with that patient. Diana says, I know all the answers, but I like multiple choice best. Yeah, that's right. I, I, I get it. And that's the test is multiple choice, which is good. But I wanted to use this way as a study guide, because if you know it like this, then I know you know it. You get what I mean? One of the ways that I test my, my actual students is that I ask some open ended questions like this. And this is why I'm doing this now on this channel. Because when I ask open-ended questions without them seeing the answer in front of them, I know you know it, okay? This is how you get deep and make sure you can understand, you make sure you know it. All right, true or false, a provider's prescription pad should be kept in a locked space. Is that true or false? Hey, she's just not, hey. Um... Yes, guys, make sure you like the live. It's 27 people on here, guys. Like the live so that it can get out there to more people. Exit out the chat box and like the live. 27 people watching, like the live. Okay, so I see mostly true. I see a false there. Let's see. <clears throat> All right, so this is going to be true. Provider's pad should be locked, right? So that's something that sh absolutely should be locked away. Why? Because patients can get a hold of it and write their write, um, false prescriptions. Even providers themselves, they could lose it. They could abuse um, prescriptions. So they should be kept. When I worked in cardiology, that's the last office I worked in, um, I kept the prescriptions locked. And they, you know, most of the time they use e, e 
e-prescribed anyway where they were sending it. Um, but if they had to do a written prescription, they would come to me. I kept them locked at my desk. So yeah, absolutely. They should be locked away. All right. What program would an MOA use to create a database? What type of program or software should the, and when I say MOA, I just mean a medical office assistant. So when you guys see me do that, that's all I mean is MO, medical office assistant used to create a database. What program is that? <laughs> what program is that to create a database? This is something else you got to know. Somebody say word, access. Let's wait a couple more seconds, see if anybody else types anything different. Somebody says access, Microsoft processing. All right, let's see. Yep, so that's Microsoft Access. So for those, so if you know it, you know it. So it doesn't matter how they access. So they may X. They may ask it just like that. Which of the following is used to create a database? And you know, or they may say, what type of program is Microsoft Access? Then you know it's a database program, okay? All right, now what program um, is used for uh, creating a spreadsheet? Which program is used to create a spreadsheet? <clears throat> Okay, I see somebody said Excel. All right, I see Excel popping up. Looks like you all got that one. Yeah, you looks like you all pretty clear on Excel as a spreadsheet program. So that one, that's a pretty easy one. I think you guys are pretty good with that one because we know that's what Excel is for. So no matter how it's written, which of the following is a spreadsheet program, you know it. What is Microsoft Excel? No matter how it's written on a test, you'll know it. If it's if the if the question on the test says of uh, the provider um asks you to create a spreadsheet, which program are you going to use? You know what it is, so it doesn't matter how it's worded. All right, now creating a letter. What would the medical office assistant use to create a letter? Which program is that? Creating a letter. For some of you, this is a piece of cake, but some of you guys may not know this. All right. <clears throat> See word. Hey Shelly. I, did you see me shout you out in the beginning? Hopefully you were on here. <clears throat> All right. I'm saying Microsoft Word. Yep. And that's correct. So um, another way they may ask the question, what, what program do you use to create a letter? It may say which of the following is a word processing program. So, you know, that's Microsoft Word. Okay. All right, um, what program would the MOA use to schedule meetings and send emails? What program is that? Scheduling meetings and sending emails. You guys, I'm sure probably know that too. You got an iPhone. I don't know if um I don't know if Android has it as well, but I know we definitely have it on iPhone. Somebody said Teams. Okay. Okay. Looks like nobody else is saying anything. Let's go. Let's see what the answer is. So that was a good guess. This is going to be Microsoft Outlook. So um, you know what, Gemini? That's a good guess because we do hold meetings on Teams. That's a good guess. Um Teams, um, I don't know how new or how old Teams is, but when they redo these tests, I heard that soon they are going to be redoing these tests and updating the questions and stuff. So maybe Teams will be included in this new in, in these new questions. I think they are updating the test. I, I, I heard it's going to be in September, I believe. So eventually I'm going to have to do you know, updated study guys. I'm pretty sure the information is still going to be the same. So I'm going to leave the videos up, but they're going to be updating every so often, every few years or so. Um, they, they switch up the test and they update it. They add more information, take some information out. So, um, but that was a good guess. Yeah. Microsoft outlook emails and also, um, for scheduling. 
Oh, Stephanie said January 2023. Is that what you heard? It's going to be um, it's going to be um January 2023. Okay, Gemini said we use um Teams and not Outlook anymore. Got you. So like um we still use Outlook for email, but to hold meetings we use um we use Teams at, at my school anyway. Um, NHA said January. Okay, gotcha. Okay, so January. So we still got some time. Thank you. All right. Uh, what's what is PAR short for? What does that mean? PAR. What is PAR? PAR. <clears throat> Sorry guys, I was taking a, a sip of my juice real quick. All right, I don't see anybody typing anything. Let's see what PAR stands for. Participating provider. Make sure you guys know that. Participating provider, okay? PAR. That is referring to the provider who's in contract on network with the with an insurance company. Okay, make sure you know that PAR refers to participating provider. Or oh, it looks like the answers came up a little later. Um, I see your answers, Cassandra and Shelly. Yeah, PAR means participating provider. Make sure you know that. Um, that is the doctor that is in network with that insurance company. Okay, that doctor has signed a contract to provide services. Um, they are, you know, um. They're in contract or in network. All righty. True or false? Petty cash can be used to buy office furniture. <clears throat> Is this true or false? And of course, on the test, there are no true or false answers. But if you know this, you know it. So if you see this option on the test, then you know this is incorrect. All right, this is false. Petty cash is just used for little miscellaneous things, like maybe you we need some more postage stamps or something like that. Maybe, you know, there's an office depot up the street. We realize we ran out of paper. We may need to, you know, grab a couple packs of paper. It's not to be used to order office supplies, right, in bulk because we have a budget for that. So it's not used for that, but we do use petty cash for little miscellaneous stuff like stamps. And if we need to, you know, run out and grab something, um, in small amounts, okay? So if you see that question, then you already know what petty cash is used for. I was the first thing an MA do when pulling charts for the day. What's the first thing you should do? You got to pull charts for the day, right? Let's say today is, well, today is Friday. You got to pull charts for Monday. What's the first thing you need to do before you pull those charts? Um, and one thing I told you guys before with these questions, when you know, um, when you know protocol, when you know things that you have to do in, in whatever order, you're ready for the test. You can take the test. For an example, when you know what you need to do, what is everything you need to do the evening before the um, before an appointment, right? Then when you see those questions on the test, you know it. So if you're able to explain that this is what I this is everything I need to do the evening before the test, if you can explain what you need to do as soon as you open the office in the morning what you need to do when you close it in the evening, if you can explain what the process is for making an appointment, right? Checking a patient in and checking a patient out, guess what? You you can explain the whole process, then you'll know the questions when you see them. And that's what I mean when I'm constantly reiterating, make sure you study the content and not the questions. All right, let's see. Yep, check the schedule. Check the schedule for today. So if you see the, the question that says, what is the first thing, keyword, first thing you do? You got to look at the schedule first, okay? Can't pull the charts without the schedule. So somebody said, put them in order. So you will eventually put them in order. That will be the next thing. Once you pull them, you'll put them in. Most likely you may put them in order that the patients are coming in, right? Maybe even in alphabetical order, depending on how your office does things. Um, but yeah, the first thing you, you got to look at the appointment schedule to know what to pull. I right, was hyperlipidemia. What is that? Hyperlipidemia. Um, make sure you guys know 
um, medical term, right? You should know what hyper means, right? You should know what lipids refer to. Now, people always ask, what do I need to study for the test? I did a Q&A live, um, what was that? Last week, one day last week. So um, in that, in that um, live, somebody had asked a question about what they need to know. And I gave you guys some foundational things, even though it was more than that, but I gave you guys some foundational things. So check that video out if you haven't already. But medical term is one of those foundational things. You should know what hyper is just by looking at it. You should know what lipid is, right? Even without even seeing multiple choices, okay? So make sure you're studying that um, your your um, multi, your um, medical terminology. Make sure you can recognize, you know, body system. Well, I meant body organs and body parts, okay? All right, let's see. So that's a high concentration of fatal lipids in the blood. Hyperlipidemia is another name for high cholesterol. Okay, so high cholesterol is hyperlipidemia. High concentrations of fat and lipids in the blood. Okay. Yep, I see you guys put too many lipids in the blood, higher than normal lipids and fat. Exactly. And, and right there, when you saw hyper, that lets you know, okay, I know that that means an increase or high number of something, right? or over too much, right? So if it was hypolipidemia, that mean it was low concentrations of fat, right? I don't even know. Now that I mention that, is that even a thing? I got to look that up, hypolipidemia. It prob probably is. I've never heard of it. All right. Wh which part of Medicaid covers prescriptions? I know we went over this before for those of you that's joining me. For those of you that's always here, you guys probably see the same, a lot of the same stuff written different ways. That's because... Um, you know, like I said, you've been on here every time and you're going to see some of the same questions written in different ways when you take the test. All right. Everybody's saying D. Yep, that's correct. So how do we how do we how do we um, memorize Medicare? Right. Medicare A. So A is inpatient. B is outpatient. Right. Medicare C is both or Medicare Advantage, AKA Medicare Advantage, and then D is drugs, right? Think about drugs, that's prescriptions. So prescriptions are drugs. So A is in, B is out, C is both, AKA Medicare Advantage, because it may be written like that. It may say which Medicare Advantage is which part of Medicare. You gotta know that C. And then of course, D is drugs. All right. True or false, it is within a medical office assistance scope to sign a referral letter to another provider. Is this true? Can an MOA sign a referral letter to another provider? Okay, I see mostly false. Let's see. That's correct. It is false. We cannot sign referral letters. We can't sign lab reports. We can't sign orders or referrals, anything like that. What we can sign, we can sign um, um, if we have to send a patient a letter uh, that their appointment is coming up, we can sign those appointment reminders. If we have to reschedule their appointment, we can sign that. If a um, provider has us draft a letter to someone, um, we, we can sign that, but the provider also has to sign too. So there may be some instances where you may have to write a letter for a um, provider. And, that, and by the way, I don't think this is on this part right here that I mentioned is, is on the test, but I'm just letting you know that there may be some times where you will have to sign a letter, um, but the provider will sign as well. And you will just sign that you're the one composing the letter. Um, the dismissal letter signed by the provider. We can send the dismissal letter out, but the dismissal letter signed by the provider. Um, what form is used for billing purposes? Now, I will say now, um, if it's a situation where the dismissal letter is one of those things where you may sign as well, like you compose it and the doctor signs it, then maybe, Shelly. Um, but um, the dismissal has to come from the provider. Um, what form is used for billing purposes and is attached to the patient's chart for the provider to complete? It um, has pre-printed CPT and diagnosis codes to choose from. 
This form makes billing so much easier because everything is right there for you. It's time to put patient's chart for the provider to complete. All right, I'm seeing CMS 1500. I see encounter form. I see if anybody else puts anything else. All right, let's see. So yes, encounter form, AKA super bill. Okay, yes. Um, so I see a few people put CMS 1500. So this is why I wanted to do these, um, these questions like this. So that way you can define what an encounter form is. So just in case you see this question asked, you know, this is an encounter form period, right? It may be asked in several different ways. That's why I added, um, both, both definitions. Um, but no, so encounter form. So remember with CMS 1500, that's the claim form. The claim form is blank, okay? So it's not going to have anything pre-printed on it. There's not going to be any pre-printed CPT codes or diagnosis codes. Why? Because we're going to have to write those in, okay? Now, the encounter form, however, or super bill does have pre-printed diagnosis and CPT codes because remember the encounter form, um, and I did a, a video on this channel showing you guys the differences between the CMS 1500 and encounter form. So those of you, I know a couple people mentioned that they were just starting class. You may want to check that out so you can see that too. Um, but um, the um, encounter form is specific to that practice. So if you work in GYN gynecology, that encounter form is going to have a bunch of pre-printed um, CPT codes for like pap smear, um, pelvic exam, STD testing and things like that, well woman exams and stuff like that. And then um, diagnosis codes as well that goes with that, um, like abnormal periods, routine physicals, and things like that. So it's going to be specific to that practice. Now, if you work in cardiology, the pre-printed CPT codes are going to have to do with EKG, stress tests, echocardiograms, and things like that, right? Diagnosis codes pre-printed on this going to be like chest pain, palpitations, all right? So every encounter is going to be specific to that practice. It's pre-printed. CP commonly used CPT codes and um and diagnosis codes. All right. Now, if there happens to be something that's on there, on 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 the encounter, I'm sorry. If it happens to be something that's not on the form, then you will have to write it in. If the doctor does something that's not on the form, okay. Oh, glad to know. Shelly said that video was helpful. The encounter form versus um versus claims form so make sure you guys check that out just in case you've never seen one and you can get an idea of it now the encounter form when it's filled out it makes your life so much easier why because the provider has already given you all of their um codes that you need you don't have to go looking through the chart to find the codes and there's actually a question that you may see on a test that does ask that it'll say something like which of the following um do you use to make sure you're filling out the claim form correctly. And that's going to be the encounter form. Okay. So that's a, that's a good thing to know too, because when that counter form is filled out, everything is there for you. All you're doing is transferring what the doctor put on the encounter form to the claim form. Okay. What form lists all of a patient's charges and payments and is kept in their medical record? What form is that? It's a list of all the patient's charges and payments that they've made, and and it's cop and it's kept in the patient's medical record. All right, let's see. I see somebody says super bill. <clears throat> so super bill. So we just mentioned what the super bill is. The super bill is a pre-printed um, form. Of, I mean, it's a form with pre-printed CPT codes and diagnosis codes. It's not a list of patient payments. 
Somebody said daily log or ledger. So this is going to be the patient ledger. Many people get the daily log and ledger mixed up, but the patient ledger, a patient ledger is specific to that patient and it goes inside their chart and, and it lists all the payments um, that a patient has made um, and um, their charges. Okay. So electronic medical record, it's of course going to be electronic version, paper medical record. There'll be a paper version on the billing side. All right, so what form lists the practices charges and payments for today? So the ledger, the patient ledger is specific to that patient and it's for the patient's charges and payments, right? And it goes in their chart, in their medical record. What form lists the practice overall, all of the charges and payments for today? What form is that? <laughs> Okay, somebody said day sheet. Yes, click the like button. Thank you, Veronica, for mentioning that. Make sure you guys are liking this video if it's helping you out. That helps me out. All right, let's see. So that's going to be the daily log, a.k.a. day sheet. OK, so those are kind of used interchangeably. The daily log or day sheet, that's the practices list of charges and payments for the day. For the whole practice. So remember, so I, I noticed somebody in a previous question put log or ledger. So just remember the day sheet or log, the daily log is for the practice in general. Right. And then the ledger um, and then the, and it's only for that day. OK, the daily log or day sheet is only for that day, whereas the ledger is ongoing for that specific patient in that patient's medical record, okay? All right, what time of day should you schedule a patient who needs to fast for eight to 12 hours prior to the appointment? So the patient has to fast. Maybe the patient's having blood work or they're having a procedure. When is the best time of day to schedule that person if they need to fast eight to 12 hours prior to the appointment? What, what would you guys say is the best time of day? And you're going to have some questions like this, like to some of you guys, you may say this is a common sense question, right? Believe it or not, some of those questions are going to be so easy because they're common sense. Um, somebody actually put in the comments. Um, I, I, I can't remember if it was this earlier this week or last week, but they were basically saying that they were able like they don't have any medical experience. But a lot of the questions they were able to get right. Um, they were just going through my video, but they were able to get a lot of it right because it was common sense. And it is true. Some things are going to be common sense. And then there's going to be, you know, a lot of questions where you absolutely, you know, of course, definitely still study. But you will have some of those questions that you will just be able to just fly through. And this is one of those things where obviously we want them early in the day, right at the beginning of the day, because we don't want to get, put them in the afternoon or end of the day and they have to. They've already been fasting all night since the night before, and then they got to fast all day. So you always want to try to get them as early as possible in the morning. Somebody specified, Cassandra said 8 a.m. She specified the time. <laughs> but yeah, definitely the first available at the beginning of the day, as early in the day as possible. Who is eligible for Medicaid? What, what population is eligible for Medicaid? A lot of people get um, Medicaid and Medicare mixed up. Okay, I see low income. And that's correct. Low income and underserved population. Exactly. Exactly. Now, who's eligible for Medicare? Many people get these two mixed up. Who's eligible for Medicare? Oh, yeah, yeah, that says some questions may be easy, but options confused. Yep, that's true. Some of those questions, they get you. 
they 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 tricky that's why you just got to know the content because they will try to get you yep you guys are correct over 65 or um disabled so you can be under 65 yes lord thank you for adding that kidney failure patient as well thank you for adding that so 65 and over disabled and also kidney failure patients Oh, Andre says he emailed me. Okay, Andre, I'll check. I'll be able to check that email um, later. Once I get off here, I got to leave out, but I'll check my emails later. All right, it's, uh, the specified amount that a patient pays at each visit is called what? It's a specific amount, right? It may vary depending on if the patient is seeing a specialist or their primary care physician, emergency room, um, but it's a specific amount that they have to pay each time. All right. That's a pretty easy one, right? Co-payment. Veronica, what happened to your um are you on a different account? What happened to your um your thing? All right, um this is what a patient must pay out of pocket before insurance starts to pay. What is that called? What a patient must pay out of pocket before insurance starts to pay. What is that out of pocket expense? Now, copay is also an out of pocket expense, but as we mentioned, that's that's paid at the time of the visit. But this is another out of pocket expense that the that the patient has to pay. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Um, another out of pocket expense that a patient has to pay before insurance starts to pay. All right, I'm seeing deductible. All right, that's correct. A lot of people be getting this confused with premium. So if you see this question, it's not premium. So deductible has is the out of pocket expense. Like think about the the easiest way I can make I can talk about this is um I can um explain this is think about like your car, right? You got car insurance if you get in an accident and you got to go through your insurance, you got to pay that out of pocket um, $500 or $1,000, depending on what your deductible is. You have to pay that before the insurance company will pay. So health insurance is the same way. This is an out of pocket expense that the, that the patient has to pay before the provider will start covering. Okay. Now, oh, let me go back. And then the premium, the difference between the premium and the deductible is that the premium is the amount that the patient pays to keep the insurance active. Okay. So it's also an out-of-pocket expense. Premium is also out of pocket, but that's what they pay to keep it, to keep the insurance active. All right, now this is a percentage that has to be paid after the deductible has been met. Now see, Shelly already saw it. She says co-insurance. Um, percentage that has to be paid after the deductible has been met. This is also an out-of-pocket expense. All right, I see co-insurance, I see premium. So remember premium, that's the amount that you have to pay to keep the insurance active okay that's like your membership fee that you have to pay look at it like that like a membership fee like you pay that every month or every six months or every year to keep it active this is what has to be paid after the deductible has been met and that's correct it's the co-insurance so once the deductible has been met and the insurance is now paying for the patient's care um the pay the the patient will have a co-insurance like um that they have to pay right so it could be 80 20 and that means that the insurance is paying 80 percent and the patient has to pay 20 percent. OK, and if you happen to see this on a test and they ask, you know, the patient has a co-insurance of 80, 20 and they may say the visit was, I should say, 300 or 500 dollars or whatever. Right. How much does the patient have to pay? Because, you know, the patient has to pay 20 percent of that, you would um, calculate 20 percent of 300. And that would be, you know, the. Um, multiplying 0.20 times $300 or 0.20 times $500, whatever the amount of the visit is, you will multiply by the percentage. So what if it was 70, 30 and it's 30% the patient has to pay. So you will multiply 
0.30 times however much the visit costs, and that will give you the patient's coinsurance. So Shelly says keyword is percentage. So that's a good thing to remember when you're trying to remember the difference between copay and coinsurance because they both are amounts that you have to pay, but copay is a specific amount, right? The patient always knows how much is going to be, whereas coinsurance, the patient won't know how much they have to pay until the visit is billed. So that way, that's the when they'll know how much they have to pay because the, the visit or the procedure has been billed, okay? Uh, determining which insurance is primary, secondary, or tertiary is referred to as what? Determining which insurance is primary, secondary, or tertiary is referred to as what? What is that called? What is that process called? I don't see anything coming up. I guess it's a delay. All right. Somebody says coordination, COB, PJ. Yep, coordination of benefits or COB. Make sure you guys know that coordination of benefits. People get these of benefit questions mixed up. There's three of benefit um, terms that you may see and people get all of those mixed up. So make sure you know those you got the well, I don't want to mention them because we may see them on here, but um, coordination of benefits. So coordination of benefits is determining which um, insurance is secondary well, it's primary, secondary, and tertiary, right? All right, how many provisions does HIPAA have and what are they? How many provisions does HIPAA have and what are they? If you know what HIPAA stands for, And you should know the two provisions within that. I'm going to give this a couple, a few more seconds because you're probably writing it out. Okay. Veronica says privacy and confidentiality. Let's see if anybody else got anything different. Somebody says two. Protection, okay. All right, let's see what this is. So two provisions, portability and accountability. So HIPAA has two provisions, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, okay? This is why I always say make sure, like, if you know what, what HIPAA stands for, then you won't write it out incorrectly. Because some people write out HIPAA, H-I-P-P-A. The H-I is health insurance. Then the P-A, those are the two provisions, portability and accountability. And then that last A stands for act, okay? Portability, sorry about that. Portability allows a patient to port their insurance with them if they change employers. Accountability, that provision of HIPAA, requires us as medical professionals it hold it requires us to keep patients information private right it holds us accountable okay so confidentiality i see why you guys mentioned confidentiality and privacy because that requires us to be accountable to keep information private or confidential i will form as a patient sign to give permission to the provider to bill his or her insurance. What form is that called? Does anybody know? The patient is given permission to bill his or her insurance. And I'll tell you guys, I'm going to do a CCMA live again next week. Um, 
the way this writing it out this way it makes it so much easier one of the reasons why i don't go live as much because this creating these slides take time when i'm doing a multiple choice way but i was able to create this a lot faster so i will be able to probably go live more do more of these sessions because doing it this way was so much easier you guys have no idea how long it takes me hours to create the multiple choice um presentations so this this took a little time but not as long so i think i'll be able to do the these sessions more now that i'm doing it like this so that's going to be the assignment of benefits so remember when i mentioned a coordination of benefits remember i said there's three of benefits that people get mixed up right so the coordination of benefits that is of course determining which insurance is primary secondary and tertiary right assignment of benefits is the form let's go back to the definition that the patient signs to give permission to the provider to bill his or her insurance okay another way is defined is that it's a form that allows the patients to assign his benefits to the provider so think about what we're saying assignment of benefits okay the patient is assigning his or her benefits to the provider okay so that's what it, that's what assignment of benefit is the patient is giving a provider permission to bill his or her insurance the other way of defining it is a patient is um, assigning his or her benefits to the provider okay uh, it allows the 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 insurance to pay the provider directly okay and it doesn't have to go through the patient and the patient pays the provider okay and then the other of simon uh, I mean, i'm sorry the other of benefits word was explanation of benefits that i mentioned earlier okay the explanation of benefits it goes to the patient and it explains the benefits so think about we're literally defining it in the word itself so assignment of benefits is assigning the benefits explanation is explaining the benefits it explains to the patient how the claim was paid if anything was denied etc okay and then the coordination of benefits coordinates the benefits the reason why i'm reiterating this so much is that most of my students get those three mixed up because they get tripped up um, off of the of benefits part okay but think about what you're saying all right I hope this was helpful. This is it for today. Make sure you exit out the chat and like this. Let me know if you guys have any questions. I'll answer any quick questions real quick before we get off um, here. So like this video, please, if it was helpful. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe. I got some things coming up. I'm going to try to get an interview done next week. I don't know if you, did you guys like that interview? I don't know if you guys caught that interview I did with Lawrence a while back, but I'm going to have my old co-teacher on with me we're going to try to do it either next week or the week after next but he and i used to teach together and he is now a manager and a, and a medical office and he's going to be talking to you guys about just giving you some tips and letting you guys know what managers are looking for today in medical assistance and medical office assistance and then you'll have the opportunity to ask him questions he's like one of my best friends he's like literally like my brother so I'm going to have him on either next week or the week after next. So make sure you guys subscribe and look out for that. Um, share with your classmates or colleagues. I've had a few one-on-one -on -one sessions so far. That, that link will be in the description of the video for anybody who needs me to look at their resume and cover letter more closely and go through it with them. For anybody who just needs some that one-on-one -on -one time with me, you can do that. It's 30 minutes um veronica says i believe you and this challenges us to remember exactly veronica i'm glad you got it she's just not said thank you everything miss k i can't wait to see you at the ccma thank you she's just not i want to um try to do it next um it probably won't be wednesday it's probably going to be next thursday evening so just guys make sure your notifications are on uh, what's a good lesson book for cmaa so nha website pj if you go to nha now dot com nha noun.com um you can um um go and order the study guide from there oh my contact info in the chat okay what my email veronica i can put that in the chat k heart cpr at gmail.com but that's my email. I, I always respond to my emails. It just takes me a little while. So I do respond to emails, but I get a, you guys, I get a lot of emails. So 
It could be late. Is this the last part of CMA? Because I want to schedule my test. Um, this is the latest one that I've done. It's not the last one. I'm sure I'll do more in the future. The next one I'm going to do is going to be CCMA practice, but this I'm sure I'm, I'm going to do more Marwa. This is part five. I got four other ones if you haven't saw that. Um, oh, yes, for those who are not. Gotcha. Thank you, Veronica. Yeah, I put my email there for anybody who needs it. So if, if you guys have video suggestions, questions, or anything like that, you can email me. If you have a quick question, you can email me. If you need more in-depth help, like you need me to sit down and get on Zoom with you, you can schedule that one-on-one -on -one session. Are you taking your test today, Kay? Oh, wow. Yeah, Kay is taking her test today. I wish you the best, Kay. I hope you pass. Make sure you let me know. Come comment back on the video as soon as you finish and let me know. Which one are you taking, CMAA or CCMA? Which one? Um, Laura says four. What's four? Um... Oh, you're saying this This is the part. Yeah, okay. Is this part four or part five? I think this is part five, right? Am I tripping? Is this part four or part five? I can't even remember now. They're sending you good luck and prayers, um, Kay. Make sure you let us know. Let me know. I think this is part, I think this was part five. Any other questions? Yeah, this was part five. Thank you, Nye. So any other questions real quick before I let you guys go, make sure you like the video, subscribe. Um, let me know if any of you guys are open to being interviewed on the channel. I know I've mentioned it before. I did one so far with, with Lawrence. He's the creator of the Inside Medical Assistant podcast. He also has a group. Oh, let me put the group on Facebook. For I've got an emails about the group. So the group is, um, what is it? Medical assistance with experience network group so that's lawrence's group on facebook it's about fifteen thousand people in that group so that's a good resource um so that interview is up and if anybody else is interested you guys can email me if you're interested in doing an interview on here i'm not i don't mean a job interview but to talk about where you are please the group for facebook and the podcast the podcast is called um inside i don't know if he's done any lately but you guys can search it it's called inside medical assistant podcast the guy lawrence you can check out the interview on my channel too if you missed it and um i'll be having more interviews coming up i got a a, a lady that i'll be interviewing and then my um uh, my old co-teacher slash best bestie all right, guys, I don't see any more questions coming up, so I'm going to let you guys go. Thank you guys for hanging in there today. I hope that this was helpful. Um, for those of you who were joining for the first time, thank you for hopping in here. And, and I will see you guys next time. Thank you, Nye. You have a great evening, too.